Good morning, Revolution, and welcome to our show this morning. All of you people who are up early today on Facebook and on YouTube, wherever you are, we're very glad to have you. And we got John Case as our special guest this morning. Good morning, John. How are you? I'm, I'm great. I'm good. It's beautiful here in West Virginia. <laughs> okay, down near Harper's Ferry. And uh, Rosanna and Anita. And Michael, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning Revolution. Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. So listen, let's start off with a, we got a couple of questions from uh, our audience uh, out there. And one of them is, can you be an anarchist and join the Communist Party? So uh, Rosanna, what do you think? Can you be a follower of for Putin and others and join the Communist Party? Well, <laughs> I think if you if you agree with our constitution and our party program, you can be in the Communist Party, which means you have to follow our policy. So anything that contradicts that, you'd have to kind of check yourself. John Case, you say those some of those people are people who got their feet planted firmly in midair. So what do you say? Can you be an anarchist and join the Communist Party? Well, uh, and that depends on who's uh, doing the admissions, but in my view, <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> no, I mean, I think you commit yourself to a degree of collectivity um, in the process. Uh, uh, I mean, there's, anarchism takes lots of forms, right? I mean, but mainly it's distinguished by a socialism or any other ideal that exists primarily just in your head. Um, and, you know, um, the verification, validation of do other people feel the same way as you do? <laughs> you know, is that important, uh, whether they do or they don't? So, no, I think that would be the, I think you'd have to move away from that tendency and, and be prepared to listen to a better one. Uh, but Anita. Lenin said, it, not that, I mean, I'm not saying it like, whenever I say Lenin said, I hear my father who mm -hmm. used to say, you sound like a Jesus freak. Jesus said, Jesus. No. So no disrespect to people who believe in Jesus. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not anti-religious, but Lenin said, Anita, it takes 10 years to join, a, to become a communist. So from that standpoint, I mean, you know, most people who join aren't, you know, whatever they consider themselves, they're really not communists yet because they're just joining. So mm -hmm. again, I ask you, can an anarchist join the Communist Party? I would say, yes, we we welcome uh, you into the Communist Party and ready to, I mean, you're you're committing yourself, as Rosanna said, to work with our program and, and with our, um, our structures. Uh, that might be contradicting your um, ideas of being an anarchist, but you take that step and join the Communist Party, and then we're going to in, in, um, engage you and you with us to move us along towards better uh, implementation of that party program. But so Michael, you up. said in the National Committee, one party, one policy, one practice. So how are you going to be an anarchist and you want to abolish the state yesterday and, and, and be in the Communist Party. I don't get it. Well, I'm thinking back to one of my first um, um, organizing trainings with the party, with this party here in the United States. It was led by Comrade Bernard down in Texas. And he said something that I, I hear his voice in my mind sometimes when I'm out in the streets recruiting young people. And it's you bring them into the party and then they become communist. You know, no one, as you said, Lenin said it takes 10 years to, to be a communist. You can't expect them to know everything and understand our party program and understand democratic centralism and Marxism, Leninism when they first join, you know, I mean, no matter how well read they are. And so there's people who join and just consider themselves to be progressive minded or anti-imperialist or anti-war or pro-democracy. And, you know, we accept them and then we work with them collectively, as John Case was saying, you know, in our reading groups and and through our collective action, and, and then they come around, and then they become developed Marxist Leninists. And so I think that's what it's all about. It doesn't really you know, matter how you identify personally, because when you join the Communist Party, you become part of something much bigger. You become something, uh, a, a part of a collective. And I think that's what matters. 
You know, there was a famous anarchist who, 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 who came into the party later in her life. It was Lucy Parsons, right? Y'all remember Lucy Parsons? Yep. She was, came out of Texas and ended up in Chicago. She was a great friend of Mother Bloor and was a Mother Bloor, no, Elizabeth Gurley, or maybe both of them, I don't know, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Well, there's a, there's a lot to talk about and um, uh, about different aspects of our positions and policy. I got into a conversation the other day with somebody who objected, and this kind of comes out of last week's show. And by the way, we got a whole lot of controversy around last week's show. Already around 3,000 people have viewed that video and bunches of comments. And I would encourage all of our readers, including the people on this show, to jump onto the comment section and comment. You know, the ideological struggle takes many forms. But this person told me, getting back to my, was that, uh, you know, we always uh, advocated that racism was a basic part of the history of this country. And, I, and, and they said that, well, you guys are saying that racism is in the DNA of the American Republic. I don't agree with that, the person said. And I'm like, how could you not agree with that? I mean, it's, you know, three-fifths of a slave in the Constitution for tax purposes, you know? In fact, it goes all the way back to 1619 and probably before that. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, um, how can you look at the history of the United States and not see that, Anita? Um, thanks, Joe. Yes, I, I, I want to just um, modify that a little bit and say, well, DNA is a biological metaphor. It's like our, our, our the United States or North America or whatever is a biological organism that has DNA. And that's very difficult to change. And I think what critical race theory and other and 1619 Project and others have shown is that racism is embedded in the structures, the legal structures and the political structures and um, and even the, the cultural um, norms that we have in, in our society. And those can be changed. I think we, we actually can tinker with them if we really struggle against them. And really we could make a difference in terms of uh, that racism. So I, I wouldn't say it's in our DNA, it's not in our biology, but it is in our mechanics and we, could, we can get rid of it. Okay, I don't think I agree with you, but that's all right. Because you know there 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 are dominant and then recessive genes, you know, and the fact of the matter is that the dominant gene has been racism, has been white supremacy, has been has been slavery, has been genocide, Rosanna, and there's anti-racism too, you know. It produces its opposite. That's also clear. Um, but uh, we need some. Rosanna, we need some genetic engineering as we go through the process of building a mass movement and social revolution. What do you think? You're muted. <laughs> you mean uh, re-engineering. <laughs> re-engineering, there you go. Yeah, I think that that's what, you know, we, we, we have to get into a practice, a, a much different practice of every, you know, of our culture, our everyday life, how we treat people, how we see people, things like that. Good point. Respect. Good point. Good point. All right, let's turn the page. A lot been going on in the uh, country and in the world during the course of the week, and and uh, one of them had to do with climate change, uh, and that John Case. What's your opinion about the international conference? Was it a success or a failure? A lot of well, people are like kind of disappointed. Well, it was uh, somewhat of a success. I mean, they did manage to issue a statement. Um, but it's clear that the, uh, I thought the biggest lesson was that in doing a transition away from fossil fuels to um, other alternative forms of energy, that you were going to have to synchronize it, because um, and, and there was if you underproduced um, 
oil and gas, for example, which was effectively done because of the pandemic, they cut back on production big time. Um, if you do that, well, and then you're, then all of a sudden demand increases and your alternatives are not enough, you know, to keep the lights running everywhere and, you know, affordably. Um, well, then you get in these the very volatile situations where national interests, I mean, Russia's primary source of income internationally is a fossil fuel energy. And that's true of, of a lot of other nations, too. And the markets are demanding it. So I think the fact that they came out with this statement is, is, is good. I mean, um, everybody wants to have more, but there's a lot of people that I think think that you're going to get this, that climate change is going to cause revolution. Climate change is going to cause us to do progress. Climate change is going to cause social progress. Um, I don't think so. I think uh, you know, the class struggle, the economic forces, what society is capable of doing without with some degree of unity, you know, we're, uh, we're a long way from that. But the path passes through a class struggle and different ruling, a different ruling class setting the priorities and defining national unity and purpose in a different way. But Michael, isn't climate change at a certain point when it becomes counterproductive to humanity's end become part of the class struggle? I see it as part of the class struggle. I don't know how we're going to ever have socialism if there's no planet to build it on. You know, that's the way I see it. How can the working class take power on a planet that doesn't exist? But I, I think it also, you have to look at the, who does, what does, who, what does climate change, um, who does it benefit? You know, why, why are these nations uh, taking their good old time, you know, trying to get it under control? And it's because of the corporations. They can't, you know, how do they tell the corporations they can no longer do the drilling and, you know, and so I think it is tied to the class question. I think it's something that affects obviously everyone. I think there's, you know, there are movements out there. There are organizations, NGOs that uh, combat climate change in different ways, different forms, and don't always represent the quote unquote working class. But it's, I think it's an issue that yeah, unites everyone, or at least it should. And so I, I hope it's something that we can all uh, get behind, especially with these different movements uh, led by young people like the Sunrise Movement uh, coming forward and demanding uh, you know, that NYU divest their funds away from um, these corporations that, uh, that, that uh, damage the planet and that aren't, you know, reversing this uh, trail that we're on. All right, John Case, I want to bring it back to you again, because I went to Youngstown last week to a funeral and I had to go to the gas station and I paid $4.50 a gallon for my gas. Inflation. People are upset about that. Yes. And 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 they they see that they think that the oil corporations are using the issue of supply, and it's a real issue. I'm not discounting that to jack up the price of commodities like oil, and all kinds of commodities are, are going up. You know, bread, milk, vegetables. You name it. Inflation. You just submitted an article right. uh, about inflation. So, it, what is the cause of this inflation that's going on? That's that, that that's taking place, in your opinion? Well, it's not Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but once you get past that, um, and, and the easy uh, proof of that is, is that it's happening all over the world, um, irrespective of actually particular government policies in some cases. It's happening in China at the production uh, factory level. It's, so it's happening everywhere. Um, it's not happening at the same level. In the United States, the risks are a little higher, but that's mainly because we have uh, very few ways to do anything about inflation. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, but the uh, when once you get past uh, at a global, yes, it's the supply chain uh, log jam. That's probably the number one uh, issue, and the reason for that is is pretty complicated. Um, on the one hand, whenever during the pandemic, people stopped buying services with their money and started buying goods, 
And goods, of course, unlike a lot of services, have to be transported. Um, and so the available capacity of transporting goods, both inside the United States in terms of trucks that are fitted for containers, for example, um, to, to uh, you know, countries that are uh, 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 m much more heavily impacted by COVID still, and so their level of production is just low. Um, and certain factories in certain countries shut down completely. Uh, some deliberately, like in China, when they had the shutdowns, they really shut things down to try and have zero COVID. Um, so, uh, as a consequence, you know, and also the other thing that shut down was transportation. Uh, during COVID. And so the oil producers, uh, including big ones in the United States, the shale industry, you know, fell big time. So did the uh, Saudi Arabia and the Middle Eastern supplies and in Russia also. They cut back production uh, in response to the pandemic decline. Well, so, so now this resurgence in demand for goods takes place, okay? and puts tremendous stress on the idle resources, or idled resources that it took place during the pandemic. And uh, so you see an, a, a lot of stress and all the stress points, of course, in the United States are ag aggravated by the fact that ever since Reagan, really, if you, I think you can go back that far, uh, just investments in U.S. infrastructure have lagged. Uh, they've been late to the game, the last thing done. Uh, the ports in the United States, many of them aren't fitted for the modern containers, or not as many anyway. So, supply chain logjam, and how is that going to be fixed? Well, not quickly. Uh, it's very interrelated with the global recovery from pan pandemic. It's also impacted by tra the trade war stance that t Trump adopted toward China. Um, there are many of those tariffs and restrictions are still in place. That's contributing to the price rise. And, um, and of course, uh, the, there's big costs that are building up uh, due to, for example, agriculture products that are waiting to be shipped, but by the time they're shipped, they're spoiled. Um, and um, so th that's, that's the number one thing behind the fl inflation. And the reason why one side of the economist says, oh, it's temporary or transitory, is because they expect that while getting these production and transport facilities up in line will be, uh, will happen, but slowly. Um, and so that's the reason for that thinking. But don't course, you so think that, that the corporations are jacking up some of the prices as well? Well, I mean, they're going to, yeah, I mean, uh, they're going to charge whatever the traffic will bear, no matter when, why, at all times. I mean, uh, so you can't, there, there'll be no gifts from uh, them on that. The you know what my big is, problem is? Razors. Yeah. I can't find razors. Well, How am I going to shave my head in the morning, Rosanna, if I can't find razors? <laughs> anyway, you know, then so, I got to buy them cheap razors and, 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 and I get cut. Oh, <laughs> So I well, walk around bleeding. Out. I mean, it's it's terrible. Yeah. Well, the other, the other <laughs> is the labor costs are rising because uh, people don't go don't want to go back to work, uh, especially in the service sector, in, under the conditions that uh, they left work from. And they also, you can tell from the strike wave and the big resignation wave that the pressures for the essential, especially on workers involved in essential services has reached a breaking point. They have, the, the market is demanding higher, I got to pay more money. But, um, so there's, there is inflationary pressure on, on many fronts. Um, and, you know, it's debatable how long it's gonna last. But the number one thing from a working class standpoint is, is that year to year, real wages declined by 1%. Now you know that that's having a profound impact on people's thinking. You just know it. I mean, you don't, you don't have you don't have to if you lived in the working class way of life for uh, most of your life, uh, as, as we have, I think um, you know what impact that's having. But well, my big question, Rosanna, is 
what impact is it going to have on the elections coming up in uh, next November? Everybody's crowing about, uh, oh, the Republicans are going to win. The Republicans are going to win. And then with the redistricting, you want to make a prediction yet? Well, <clears throat> I think what we need to do is make a big push for everyone to go out and vote. We have the numbers. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign uh, did a study that showed we have the numbers if people just go out to vote. And that's our power, and that's what we have to focus on. Forget about all of these other things uh, that, you know, have a tendency to bring mor your morale down and things like that. <clears throat> and although, you know, there are this, there's the gerrymandering, the redistricting, and all of, all of these things that are being uh, attempted to put in motion, but nonetheless, we still have the power and we have to fight those things, but we still have the power as a people to go out and, and, and uh, not allow this takeover. And so I think we just gotta push people to go out and vote and not just push them, but help them to understand the power that, that uh, voting does have. Anita, have you done your Christmas shopping yet? I, I read it the other day that, that <laughs> people are spending money anyway. I don't care about the inflation. I mean, they care about it, but consumer spending is up. So I it haven't is. bought one Christmas bread, huh? I haven't either. I mean, it's only <laughs> early November, isn't it? No, I guess it's sort of later November. Yeah, it always sneaks up on me a little bit, but... um. Yeah, no, I, I'm in a really glass half empty kind of mood today on on the uh, the climate change and and uh, and also um, our ability to um, to keep the fascist forces at bay in the election coming up too. I I just say this because today uh, the Ohio legislature is is voting on its new um, very gerrymandered map that will give Republicans 13 of the 15 seats in Congress from Ohio. And it's exactly uh, an, uh, exactly what people voted last year not to do. We voted in Ohio for a, a, a more fair process and they took that and said, okay, just, you know, four year, year four year plan, uh, just perfectly gifts to the, the GOP. So that's very discouraging. And I, I hope um, Rosanna's right that the more we get, I'm sure the more we get people out to vote, but um, they're very sophisticated in the way they have gerrymandered in, in Ohio. They have every tool at their disposal and they've really um, they've really chopped everything up. They've chopped up the uh, you know democratic uh, leaning and the working class uh, voters into these you know bizarre uh, congressional districts. So yeah. I'm, Michael, I'm speaking of voting, we have a question from uh, one of our readers about voting and the past. You want to read that question real quick? And let's yeah. end the show with the responses to it. So the question is, uh, realistically, what is our path to power? Do we plan on reforming our way to communism? Because the Communist Party has existed for over 100 years and hasn't uh, achieved anything. That's what it says. <laughs> And, 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 and the person who said, my heart is broken. I just don't know what to do. He added the uh, uh, letter like, like that. So I don't know, anybody want to take a shot at uh, 15 second response? Okay, 30 seconds, John Case. Um, well, I think everything we've talked about today shows that capitalism is in crisis. And uh, when it's in crisis, uh, an organization that's been around for a hundred years can, uh, can uh, get a hundred times bigger in a, in a, in a year. And uh, the system's falling apart and showing itself incapable of repairing itself. So I think it'll take, you know, I, I joked about this with Joe for years, you know, about, uh, I don't know whether it's gonna be a communist revolution, but it might be a reform of revolution, um, a reform revolution, but uh, it's gonna take a change in class power to move forward, period. <laughs> Thank you, John. Rosanna? Well, I would say, you know, what, what saved me was studying dialectics because it really helps you to understand the process, be able to point out and, and uh, see the, the progress. We, you know, the fact that we're here a hundred years later is just 
in itself a big success because the right constantly, constantly attacks us from all kinds of angles. And we've been able to stay alive and afloat. Uh, and, and, you know, unemployment insurance, if it wasn't for the communist, uh, we wouldn't have, have uh, it wouldn't have been able to kick in in this period. But more than anything, I think it's studying the dialectical process and, and, and that will help you to not despair and mend that broken heart. Anita, keep hope alive. Yes, I agree. I agree with Rosanna. We do have to keep hope alive. I think there's a misconception out there that things have to get really bad before revolution can happen. And, and if you look empirically at history, that's not true. When, when people have hope for a better world and they can see the better world ahead, that's when, when real progress takes place. So I don't think... Uh, you know, um, achieving some reforms is hurting revolutionary uh, potential. I think it's enhancing it. Michael? Well, I, I think that, uh, I disagree that the Communist Party hasn't achieved anything and it goes beyond the 30s. I mean, you think of all the work we did in the anti-war movement, civil rights, free, uh, freeing Angela Davis, and even most recently against uh, uh, the fascist danger. You know, I think where there are some great successes. And I think like Anita says, I don't think we should limit ourselves to um, um, these kind of old concepts of, of how revolution was achieved in other countries. I mean, I see what the communists are doing in Chile. They're, they're neck and neck with the extreme right about to win the next election. Uh, but they understand that uh, winning an election isn't gonna you know, legislate in um, socialism. You, know, you, have to, you have to be involved in labor and in the social movements. You, know, you have to win everyone. You have to win the masses to, to support you. And so the path to power is uh, winning over the masses and being, I think that's the misconception about the Vanguard party that's been made recently. Oh, you guys claim to be the Vanguard. We don't claim to be anything. The Vanguard is the workers and we do our best to represent the workers uh, going forward. I want to end this show with four points. Point number one, Vietnam War. My mother used to tell us when we first started protesting, she's talking about her and her, there were, there were 10 people at Youngstown State you know, 1961, 62. He said, five years later, there were hundreds of thousands, millions of people demonstrating all over the country, you know, and helped bring that war to an end. Number one. Number two, nobody thought Obama would get, a black man would get elected president of the United States. Everybody thought it was hilarious, ridiculous. It'll never happen. It happened. Oh, the country's too racist. Point number three, nobody thought Bernie Sanders would get millions of votes, a socialist. Okay, democratic socialist. I'm a democratic communist, why not? You know, he got plenty of votes. And, and uh, so change can happen. My last story, I wanna come back to this issue of racism being in the DNA of this country. My grandmother's grandmother was a slave. She was a Native American woman. She was beat to death with a belt with holes put in it, soaked in water because she refused to carry water ordered by the overseer. 35 years old, beat to death. Racism is in my DNA, I'm sorry. And that's the positions of millions of people of color in this country, you can't get around it. You know, and it was the fight against racism that brought that horrific genocidal system uh, to an end. And it will be the struggle for equality combined with the class struggle that will bring it to an end the second time. So I know that that can happen. It's happened in our history and it's gonna happen in what's to come. Good morning, revolution, everybody. Have a great weekend. John Case, thanks for coming. Thank we you want guys. you to come All back. Right. You right. can come so, back yeah. every week if you want. You have a standing <laughs> no, invitation. All right. Take right. care, everybody. <laughs> Bye. 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 Stay, safe. stay yeah. strong. Stay safe. Stay in the fight. <laughs> Bye-bye.